for authors, filmmakers, entertainment, and all your listening needs. Listen now to Talk Now Radio, where no topic is taboo. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, um, <coughs> pardon me, folks, host, uh, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. <coughs> Got a little frog in my voice today. Uh, folks, I think there's some moisture in the air. But anyway, today I'm going to have uh, Niara Isley. Insley, I think it is. Is that Isley or Insley? It's actually Isley. Isley, okay. I, sorry about that. That's uh, Joining me, we're going to talk about her book, Facing the Shadow and Embracing the Light. Well, actually, there's the word and ain't in there. It's just Facing the Shadow, Embracing the Light. And it's got some stuff in it you probably wouldn't expect if you just went by the title alone. I noticed from reading the uh, book description and also by going through the uh, list of contents on it. So you might get some surprises. I mean... You know, it does cover the subject that the title describes, but it's got a lot more in it than what you would expect. I think you folks are likely to be really pleased uh, from what I could gather just from what I did read of it. I want to remind everybody also that Talk Now Radio is listener-supported radio, and your support keeps us, you know, listener support so we don't have to have a sponsor that can tell us, well, I'm going to back out on you. I don't like your topic manner, in other words, unless you change it. Uh, listener support, it basically means as long as we don't have to go to a sponsor, we're free to broadcast anything, whether anybody likes it or not. Um, I want to remind everybody, you can call in at 832-632-7904. And if you want to learn more about the uh, guest, it's uh, her website is Facing the Shadow. EmbracingTheLight.com. So, now that we got you here, Niara, I guess a good place to start would be for you to kind of give everybody an idea what it was it that inspired you to write this book. And I'm assuming before we ever start that it has to do with it, perhaps an alien abduction or something similar to it, but it goes far more in depth than that. Yeah. Well, that's because I pretty much sat on my story and stayed quiet about it for 14 years. But during those 14 years, I was processing a lot of my experiences. And my experiences were uh, with the greys, the extraterrestrials, and then I have another group of extraterrestrials I've had experiences with. But the worst of it, the thing that really compelled me to write the book was the military abduction and mind control abuse. And uh, you know, that was the worst part, and after, you know, 14 years, I kind of sat with it, and then I had this one pivotal thought that caused me to write the book, and there was other reasons, too, but the one thought that caused me to write the book was that by staying silent, I was, I felt like I was actually allowing that kind of abuse to continue for other people, and so when I had that thought, I just couldn't stay silent anymore, and uh, so I went public, I wrote the book, um, and I went public actually before writing the book, but I noticed that a lot of my interviews back then, people were getting really hung up on the horror story of the military abduction and mind control abuse. And that was like kind of putting my story in this little box when it's really grown much bigger as I've healed and looked at the world situation in the context of all the information I've learned. Um, I felt like I had a valuable perspective to offer other people about what's going on in the world and why this kind of abuse happens, how it's possible that it happens. And uh, there's just an awful lot in the book that uh, sheds light on a lot of things that are going on in our world today that people are probably confused and angry about. Especially the ones being abducted. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a, a, a certain amount of people out there that don't buy into that, and it's really kind of sad if you ask me. Um, oh, I know what I did with it. I am so sorry. I'm sitting here um, having trouble grabbing my next word because I'm trying to find that list of content that you sent me. Uh -huh. And I forgot that I put it in my web page builder, not on the document. <laughs> uh -huh. 
I got it now. I do apologize for that. Hey, I'm only human. What can I say? Mm-hmm. But um, going back to where we were at, um, I kind of I don't know how I had the impression that you'd had an alien abduction, but now that you have mentioned that to me here live on the air, mm-hmm. is there any connection between uh, military abductions and alien abductions? Because many people think that. Uh, the military is uh, using some kind of disguise, the alien disguise, to abduct people to cover up what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that uh, there are those that put that kind of information out there. But for me, I don't believe that that's true because um, I'm very kind of highly intuitive and I'm kind of an empath. And if, if it was people dressed up as aliens who were doing the kidnapping, um, I think that I would have felt that um, because people have a hard time masking their emotional energy. But the ETs that I had contact with, they were very flat emotionally. They were very uh, clinical. They were very scientific. They were very dispassionate. And they just didn't have that emotional energy that human beings carry around. So that's, that's my take on that. Okay. So you was able to tell that this is definitely military. Was there any effort made to to make you think it was anybody else or any other organization? No, not really. Um, not you know, not per se. Um, I I didn't really see anybody that seemed like they were dressed up in an ET cos ET costume. Uh, I mean, uh, the, and nobody tried to. Uh, I mean, they just wore their military uniforms. It's like they were out in the open and bowed with everything. Well, they did it under the cover of night, but, uh, yeah. I mean, in, in that little tiny town of Tonopah, Nevada, you know, people could do all kinds of things during the nighttime hours, and, and people would be none the wiser if they didn't have an idea what was going on. Nevada, is that anywhere near Area 51 by any chance? Um, it's in the general vicinity, yeah. So, in other words, they could abduct people or kidnap people from this little town, and... Uh, easily transport them to Area 51, do what they need to do, and bring them back and drop them off later without uh, wasting too much time? Yeah, and the and Area 51 is actually one area within the entire Nevada test site, and then up north of the Nevada test site, I think adjacent to it, is the Nellis Bombing and Gunnery Range, and that's where I worked up there as a surface air missile and anti-aircraft artillery radar operator. Okay. You Oh, you worked up there. Yeah, I was in the Air Force myself. Okay, but did you have a clearance into Area 51 by any chance? I did not have clearance for Area 51. I had only a secret clearance, and that was another reason why my experiences were so terrifying, because um, when I was out there seeing what I was seeing, I uh, I knew I didn't really have the clearance to see it, and I was really scared what was going to happen to me next. So, do you mind me asking, um, because this is going to be kind of personal, Mm -hmm. what kind of experiments they were doing? I mean, did this have anything to do with uh, hybridization or uh, trying to make a Manchurian or, you know, hybrid of any kind? Well, it it can be. Mind control at its worst and at its most diabolical actually reprograms people to be perhaps a Manchurian candidate, or programs them for other uses. At least on a mental level. Yeah. With me, I didn't seem to get that, but what the kind of programming I got was basically to uh, shut down my memory of what I saw and experienced. Now, that's pretty interesting. I mean, it, it makes me wonder uh, how many people they actually give uh, security clearances to on one level or another, only to later when they're through using them, kidnap them and erase their memory uh, so they don't have to worry about them later going public with anything. Right. I know that uh, Bob Lazar was documented as uh, saying that oftentimes he would ride the jet back and forth from uh, the test site to Las Vegas, and he would not be able to remember his entire work day. So they were doing something to mess with his memory as well. Now, he would notice a memory loss, but he wouldn't remember the actual uh, being adopted or anything like that or any uh, treatments or anything. Yeah. 
And you know, so it's maybe it's unusual for somebody like you to actually be awake during it. Yeah, it could be. There's 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 a distinction to be made here between what the military or the covert ops people do and what the ETs do, because it's really two different groups. The hybridization program really is um, something that belongs to the gray extraterrestrials. Uh, they have lost the ability to reproduce the way human beings do, but they're trying to put that ability to sexually reproduce back into their species, and that's why they're picking us up and, and taking our DNA and uh, trying to, you know, make a better gray that can uh, sexually reproduce again because they really lost something. They lost their biogenetic diversity when they made themselves into a cloning species rather than, uh, the you know, like the humans reproduce. But that's a separate issue from your military abduction? Well, it's related in this way. Um, some of the information that I was taught or given when I was being abducted by the Greys was also information that the military was interested in, specifically talking about one dream I had, which I met other people that have had the same dream and come back with the same diagram of a flying saucer. But I had a dream about how flying saucers work and that they have like a neural interface where all you have to do is sit in the chair and then that chair starts picking up your neurological impulses and kind of bonds you to the craft and then you can fly the craft through your brain activity and it's like moving one of your arms or one of your legs you just kind of think to the craft and it will go where you want it to go and that is information that the military is very interested in having they're very interested in why some people are picked up and uh, and met meddled with and why other people are not so if you're a person who has been abducted by ETs the government may have a very special interest in you trying to understand why the ETs are interested in you. Sounds like there's a link between ET and the military right there. Yeah, there is a link. So. Okay. Now, before I go too much further, um, I've been dying of curiosity. Mm -hmm. How you came about the title for your book? Hmm. Well, I really wanted to reach out more to the mainstream audience as much as possible. And so I did not put UFO or ET in the title, uh, hoping to kind of attract a new demographic of people to this field. And so far, it's doing a good job of that. <laughs> a lot of people who are not really part of the UFO field have read the book and are really now taking another serious look at the UFO field that they may have thought was just all bunk before. That's interesting. Well, I'm noticing here that... Um you got a chapter that covers the loving uh, presence versus the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a big uh, move going on. I, well, I want to call it big anyway. Of uh, people getting away from the church, and uh, uh, people are starting to wake up and realize the church just isn't delivering like it's supposed to deliver. Shall we say? Um, it's no. a little, a bit more in depth than that. <laughs> I, I do realize, but uh, for short-term pur uh, purposes, in other words. Yeah. Um, so, what are you trying to tell people uh, in a short summary in this here uh, chapter? Mm -hmm. um, well, when I was a little girl, I would go out in nature. And when I was out there, I always felt like this energy of love around me. You know, and the flowers and the trees and the wind and the birds and the insects. It just was so peaceful. <laughs> and so wonderful to be out there. And then when I contrasted that with being in church, um, well, you know, I come from a home where we had a, you know, there was a divorce when I was about 13 years old. And my mother left my dad because he was a violent alcoholic. But she was excommunicated from the Lutheran church for divorcing my father, even though she felt like she was physically at risk. And any religion that would force a woman to stay in a, in a violent and abusive marriage uh, because marriage is supposed to be forever without taking into account these other factors, that's just very hypocritical because Jesus himself, he came here to teach us to love everybody and to love ourselves. And the church is very much about us versus them and making divisions and 
I just saw it, you know, I saw it very early on as a small child. It's very hypocritical. And I stayed with the Lutheran Church through confirmation, hoping that some something would be revealed that would make it all worthwhile. But, of course, it wasn't. So after I was confirmed in the church and I didn't really get any special knowledge or insight, I left the church at that point and just walked away and just decided that I would just have no intermediaries between me and the conscious living loving universe which is I guess sort of my name for God. Well I think you made a good choice and I, I'm sorry I didn't know you were fixing to speak. Oh that's all right go ahead. No I was just going to say I think you made an excellent choice because uh, well I used to teach Sunday school myself and uh, now I speak out against the church uh, and try to reveal the truth about it because I've done a lot of research and uh, I have a lot of information in that area but um you know, I personally have come to believe that there there is a God, and I believe there is. He really wants a one-on-one relationship, not some uh, go-between that could be lying uh, about what he says and what he wants, telling you what to do. That's exactly how I feel. We don't need any mental men. We just, it's like being a Gnostic. You know, in the Gnostic scriptures, they didn't want any middleman between them and the divine. And so that's kind of how I am. I guess I'm a Gnostic, now that I have the word, where I don't believe in having any intermediary between me and God. Uh, yeah. And let's face it, if it was our children, we would probably want the same kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. And this is the kind of relationship you're supposed to have with God as a, a parent and child, according to the Bible. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh-huh. Can't do that without one-on-one, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. And, okay. I do right and it's interesting to ask who, you know, who and what kind of God is it anyway, because I think of this, you know, there's a, a type of bread that you can get at the health food store, and it has a Bible verse on it about taking millet and barley and rye and everything else like that and combining it into this beautiful, healthy bread, which seems like the Word of God. But as we know, it could have been ancient extraterrestrials thinking, wow, well, we need these people to eat lots of carbs so they have lots of energy to do to work for us. So they may have uh, put that whole directive there to try to get people to eat these high-carbohydrate diets so they could work more. Okay. I want to let you know real quick, we just got a caller while you were speaking. Okay. Uh, caller, you're on the air. Yes, sir. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Um, I just had a uh, comment for your guest. Uh, well, kind of like a uh, kind of like a backstory and a and a comment and a question, all wrapped up into one. But anyway, um, I'm most interested in finding out what she found out um, from the book's description that I was reading. It said that she had three months there of missing time. Uh, I was I was real curious in in um, what the memory she produced. Um, after the fact, um, what story emerged out of it, um, what she was being used for, what she saw, and things like that. And um, I've got my own personal experience with this. Um, I'm not sure how I got wrapped up into it, but at 15 I started boxing, and at 17 I made some people mad. There was a kid in my chemistry class that uh, had picked on me when I was a little kid, and uh, when we were kids, and, and uh, uh, I was trying to get him to go to boxing so I could beat him up in the ring and not get in trouble for it. Um, I was I was smart enough to come up with that idea. But anyway, he was in he was ROTC or something, and I didn't know that. And um, he got me to say that fighters were better than military guys, and that kind of ticked off the chemistry teacher who was like 10 year military himself. So uh, the kid that I was that got me to say that uh, mentioned where boxing was being located at, which was at the National Guard Armory. And then the chemistry teacher showed up and told my coach, well, he showed up while my sparring partner and I was sparring and told my coach that he had no right to be there. And my coach said that he was 20 year military. He earned the right to be there. And anyway, uh, they got to talking and ended up coach had to start uh, paying rent. And I quit and got a job, and then I started having experiences that I didn't remember until later. Um, 
and uh, I was seeing a counselor and stuff at that particular time at the mental health center, and I started telling them about all these experiences and stuff, and they were no help. You start telling them things they don't understand, and they just assume you're crazy and want to pump you up with pills until you're until you're a zombie, and um, uh, that's their definition of help, just, just pump you full of pills until they zombify you and make you dysfunctional. And um, so I had my own experiences. Um, what emerged from my experiences, though, from the memories that I got back, was that I was that I had uh, I was part of a five-member squad, and we would get abducted um, just from wherever we were at, um, and we would just appear to disappear to other people. We would just like disappear, and then um, we reappear somewhere else in the world in front of a group of enemy a group of enemies that usually had at least that were usually at least armed with knives and then we'd fight them and then we'd be right brought right back to where we were taken from and um we would just appear where we were taken from and everything and i and i remember whenever i was in high school it was a lot worse when I'd come back, I was I was completely nuts. I remember throwing girls down and dry humping them, and stuff like that. When I'd get back, that was um, a little graphic. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but that it's the truth from what I remember. I'm not proud of it, but I understand why I did it. Um, but in in college, it wasn't near as bad. When I'd come back, I I'd, I'd start pacing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until I calmed down. Uh, but that's the experiences that, that that's what emerged from the memories that I got back. And I'm just kind of curious, uh, uh, what emerged from your guest's memories, uh, when she got her memories back. Okay. Well, um, what happened was I discovered the three months of missing time and I had this wave of nausea that came over me about it. Didn't actually get sick, but I felt like I was going to. And about a year, within a year, um, I ran into Bud Hopkins at a conference in Las Vegas. It was the Whole Life Expo. And I talked to him after his talk, and he asked if I'd like hypnosis to try to shed light on what had happened to me. And we did a hypnosis session that night. And basically what came out from that hypnosis session, and then together with a later one I had with another lady named Gloria Hawker, um, is basically that I was drug out of my motel room in the middle of the night at gunpoint and uh, taken out to, air, out not to Area 51, but out to the radar range. And we tested the radar to see if the radar could track these special aircraft. And the special aircraft were flying saucers. Um, I did see them after we were done running the test. I was standing out of the deck of the radar van. It was nighttime, and there were saucers in the sky. Um, quite a few. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the number. I think it was nine, but there could have been more. And I was looking at the one closest to me because it was just so remarkable to look at and think, wow, this is really for real. And I probably would have been really excited to see it had the situation not been so terrifying, you know, because there were people with guns, there were people saying, you will not speak to each other beyond what's necessary to run this test. And then after we were done at, with the, at the radar site, I was taken to what I believe was Area 51. Possibly the bus windows were painted over, so I couldn't see where I was really being taken. Um, but we were taken to a medical facility, and at that medical facility I was injected with drugs. And uh, then later I was, uh, I, I was sexually assaulted by two security guards. That seems pretty consistent with with a lot yeah. of the stuff that I've read mm -hmm. um, about other people saying, uh, uh, particularly the women part about being sexually assaulted. Yeah, um, you're uh, you're not the first person in the military um, that, that I mean that was legitimately in the military that recalls missing time yeah. uh, from being in the military, and that um, uh, from what I can understand, a lot of the a lot of the women military members that that, um, that uh, uh, report having missing time. When they start getting their memories back, they, they, um, they uh, too, uh, 
recall being sexually assaulted and stuff like that. See, that's that's pretty um, consistent with what I've with what I've with, with what I've uh, uh, studied on the or read on the topic. Um, my memories are a little bit different than everybody else's, and, and when I started to get my memories back, I reached out to some of these my labs and super soldiers. And they just cut me down and cut me down and cut me down, and I had to do. And I and I, I couldn't talk to my counselor about it or anything up at mental health because they just, you know, you get into mind control, you get into things like that, you get into super soldier stuff, and then they they shut down and just conclude you're crazy and want to pump yeah. you full pills. So I had to deal with that on my own, and the way I dealt with that on my own was um, by drinking a lot. Yeah. After it, it helped me confront what had happened to me and everything like that. And I'm pretty sure that it did happen to me or mm-hmm. something at least did happen to me because um, I, I've had two mem- two parts of my memory substantiated. I remember to being at r- r- somebody saying that I was at Ranger Indoctrination Program when mm-hmm. I was 17 years old. And I... Um, found some ranger videos on the internet and talked with somebody who identified themselves as a ranger and I said is there a zip line over a lake at ranger indoctrination program he said yeah we call that victory pond so that was a substantiation of something that I had remembered doing at a place that I was told ranger indoctrination program and it substantiated that memory then some years later, well, um, then five years later, it started happening to me again. This time I was in college, though. I wasn't in high school no more. I was in college. And um, there, I was staying with this lady um, and uh, at the time, and um, she, uh, well, uh, we weren't together or anything. I didn't even know who she was. Um, but I was staying with this lady at that time. And I remember her taking me to um, the dentist, and he was going to give me a mouthwash for gingivitis, but he said, I remember him telling her that I wouldn't remember to take it because I had fighter's eyes, and that's something else that if you mention that to uh, um, uh, uh, the mental health people or whatever, they don't understand. They just think it doesn't exist, and you're crazy, and this and that. But anyway, um, so she said, you know his eyes? And he said, yeah, my son was a fighter. So he he understood what was going on with me at that time enough to know that I wouldn't remember to use the mouthwash he prescribed. So some years later, after I got these memories back, I was still seeing that I was still I was seeing that same dentist, and I asked him. I said, "Was your son a fighter?" And he said, "Yes." There's no way I could have known that unless I was there that day with that woman when he said that. So I, I'm I've gotten little pieces of the memories that I have confirmed, but I still don't know enough about what happened to me to determine what exactly happened, whether it was all pure mind control or whether it, uh, or whether I was part of something that was like way above top secret. I don't know. But uh, I wasn't remembering anything at the time that this was happening. So uh, I'm sure the people that knew about my eyes knew that I would remember later but I don't think they were too worried about me knowing too much because if I told anybody, then they'd think I was just crazy anyway. So, you know, it, yeah. I, don't, I don't think they were too too worried about a 17-year-old kid being on a flying saucer with little gray aliens. And I do remember being on a flying saucer at 17 and seeing little gray aliens walk about on this flying saucer, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But my, my experience is that the aliens and the government uh, the aliens and the military are working together now not maybe your your um your basic uh radar operator or your basic you know uh ground pounding soldier has no idea that this is happening that the two are working together but way up, way up way up in the ranks way up deep in the ranks they know that this is what this is taking place but the but the regular everyday ground pounding soldier and radar operator and maybe even their immediate um, uh, superior, even their immediate superiors may not know that this connection exists and they don't understand, they don't understand what they're seeing, but um, way down deep in the military um, is knowledge that they're working together. Mm-hmm. 
But anyway, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for taking time. I, uh, but like I said, I, I had my own experiences, and that's why your uh, story seems so fascinating to me. Well, you might really benefit from reading my book because I wrote my book for my own healing, and I wrote it for the healing of others. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. Um, but uh, uh, I'm pretty much over my stuff now. I mean, uh, it took me about five years of, of having the memories and everything, and, and I still constantly get memories back. Um, they're not all of, the, of, of uh, you know, fighting here and there and everything. It's, you know, sometimes they're mundane things of just being at Walmart or something, you know. Yeah. But uh, um, uh, I've kind of pretty much got over got over it now. Mm-hmm. But anyway, thank you. I'll talk to you later. Uh-huh, thanks. Uh, thank you for coming in. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, now, i got to ask you, just out of curiosity, have you ever been abducted by aliens? Me? Um, yeah. yeah. So you've been abducted by the military and aliens both? Yeah, the the uh, alien abduction started when I was uh, just a little girl, very small little girl. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, I also partly ask you this because one of the chapters in your book um, deals with an uh, alien lover's strange pregnancy. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think you carried a hybrid uh, baby at one point? Oh, yeah. I think I, for some reason, I really have a feeling that I had maybe as many as 17 hybrid offspring. But it's not like having a baby on Earth. I mean, they they get you pregnant, and then they come and take the baby in the first trimester. And uh, they take it on their ship, and they put it in an incubation tank. And sometimes you see the baby later, you know, like they've learned that uh, when they're trying to cross humans with uh, their own genetics, that the human, the human part of the child needs touch and needs love. And so they often have the parents come and hold the children uh, to give them that touch and that, that love connection of the parent that they seem to need. Without it, they just don't thrive. Okay. Now, another section in your book that caught my attention Mm -hmm. is just what is memory. I thought it would be nice to hear how you would define memory. Yeah, well, after your memory has been tampered with, you really want to understand what the heck's going on. So (laughs) um, I guess I've thought about memory so much since uh, my experiences came to light because I kind of, you know, I kind of wanted to understand why and how memory could be erased. And so as I've observed to myself in conversation with people, um, I notice that if they say something, uh, say they say UFO, well, immediately my mind will take the word UFO and it will bring up all these different associations about UFO, and then my mind will pick the uh, the closest one, the one that seems most appropriate, and then I'll add that into the conversation. And so it's kind of like it's a scientific observation process to really see that that memory has almost like a fractal dispersion. So if you sit down and you talk with someone for an hour and both of you have a, a life of different experiences and different ways of looking at things, different perceptions, so you're sitting there having a conversation, you might start out on one topic and then it branches and branches and branches from both of your conversation into something that an hour later it doesn't even remotely relate to the beginning topic and so it just it just kind of makes branches and 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 chains in all these different directions and so as i started looking about at that then i knew about the brain and the neurons in the brain and how the body is kind of an electrical system and all this stuff is firing and I thought they must have some way to actually go into the brain and zap the neurological connections to isolate a block of memory and keep you from being able to access it. And I would take that one step further because um, as an intuitive and you know, a person who's psychic and interested in the human energy system, um, I've learned that our memories and who we are are actually stored in our human energy field or our aura. 
And when you're hypnotized or when you're with an intuitive reader or a psychic reader, they can read what's in your aura. And so I think actually now that the brain is more like a piece of hardware that we use to access our memories that reside in our aura, and that the brain may not actually be the, the repository of memory, but it may be a piece of biological hardware that help, helps us access our energetic memory. That's kind of how I think about it now. Kind of like a doorway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, one of the things also that caught my attention was the fall of Lyra, the flight to Terra, and I'm assuming Terra would be Terra Firma, another word for Earth. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, so your tale here, the fall of Lyra, is that mimicking the same Lyra that was mentioned by Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet, uh, is where uh, the Atlanteans came from? Yeah, I believe so, because uh, that's where I came from, and we had a... Uh, we had an invasion on Lyra. You know, Lyra was this beautiful place. It was kind of like, uh, kind of like Pandora, I guess. You know, this beautiful, pristine uh, environment. And we we took care of it. We lived in harmony with it. And then we had an invading force come in, and started mining our planet. And then they started actually killing my people. And my people were not warriors. Um, and so. But we did have spacecraft, and so we took a lot of our young people and we put them on spacecrafts and we sent them elsewhere in the galaxy. Uh, some of them went to, uh, like Arcturus, some of them went to the Pleiadian system, and some of them came here to Earth. And the ones that came here to Earth were actually wanting to start a colony of uh, human humanoid beings here. And so we came here and we started working with uh, the the beings, the, the life forms that were here to create a species very similar to ourselves. And then that, you know, so that we landed in Lemuria, and then Atlantis uh, kind of came out of Lemuria. So and that these it sounds yeah, kind of like Eden to me. It is kind of. And uh, these memories <clears throat> do not come from hypnosis. These memories have been spontaneously emerging in me all of my adult life. Past life recall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, we're running a little shorter time, so to move things up a little bit, mm-hmm. um, why don't you tell us some of the other things that we can find in the book uh, that you think are important to point out that I'm, I want to make sure I don't miss? Well, let me pull a copy up here real quick. Um I guess the book is basically divided into three sections. The first section is about my experiences, and it's just called The Experiences. And then part two is uh, about healing the path to within, and that is about kind of what it took to heal. Like the the gentleman that called in, um, he he ran into that too. He was, it was very difficult for him to try and heal or get any help for healing uh, in our current culture because our current culture just doesn't really understand that these kinds of things go on. They think it can't possibly go on, so they label you as crazy. But the, thing, but the good news is that they are starting to open up a little bit more. You ever think about maybe uh, providing a place for say, people like you and uh, the caller to meet and uh, share and, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe make a, a safe haven for other people in, in y'all's position? Yeah, well, I am working on doing that um, because I have disabilities, back, di- you know, back pain and, and some other things. Writing the book took a pretty bad toll, and I'm still kind of recovering from it. Um, and there's so much to do on the computer, I end up sitting too much as it is, but... Um, right now, I'm kind of taking some healing time, and on Facebook, there are many groups um, that deal with the military abduction issue and the mind control abuse issues, and there are some very good support groups out there on Facebook. A lot, they, they may be a little hard to find because usually they're labeled secret, and so you, you, only, only the members can see that they're there. 
but it's really it's really been uh, the one that I'm part of has been really a good group, and I will be starting groups of my own in the in the not too distant future. But I, I've got some things I gotta you know take care of in my life right now, and back care is one of those things. And then the third part of my book is called Awakening. And it's about how my consciousness has awakened through processing all these experiences and how much more alive and aware and awake I am today. Mm. And uh, so those are the three sections of the book. And I go into a lot of things besides my experiences. What I, I'm trying to do is um, I'm sure that some of that you and some of your listeners are familiar with the law of attraction. Oh, what, yes. Yeah. Well, one of the most important things people need to understand about the law of attraction is that the powers that be on this world understand it very well, and they have been managing our consciousness down through the ages to create from the law of attraction, from our own mental and spiritual energy, a version of the world that works for them and keeps us subject to them. And so I have a lot of information in the book to get people to start huh. looking at the ways they've been indoctrinated to participate in this reality so that they can start to pull their energy out of that and we can start to create a new reality. So basically, fostering mental illness uh, and medicating could be setting up their little utopia. It certainly could. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the millions that the uh, pharmacies make off from it. The, uh, they actually keep people in a st the state of mind they want to keep them in. That's right. And in, in the movie The Matrix, people were hooked up to the virtual reality net with cables coming out of their bodies. In our Matrix, uh, the cables are indoctrination through education, indoctrination through religion, indoctrination into nationalism and patriotism, and indoctrination into um, all kinds of different areas of our society where we're programmed and controlled to think of things in a particular way. And it's really important that we dig down and we look at the really real truth underneath everything so that we can start pulling our energy out of the indoctrination programs and putting it into building a world that really works for all people. Yeah, I'm an ex-military man myself and considered myself very patriotic. I used to think it was something to, you know, really be proud of and all of that. Until later years, it finally dawned on me that the same pride that you're putting into this uh, patriotic title is actually a source of control for others. It can be, you know, through, like through, you know, pulling your ego string. In other words, they can get you to go to war and do their fighting because it's the patriotic thing to do, and you want to be a patriot. In other words, right? But even that is propaganda. That's a propaganda complaint. You know, it's. Uh, I still consider myself a patriot, but I'm a patriot that holds to the ideals, the wonderful ideals that the, this country was founded on, that have now been subverted and turned into something else altogether. And that really irritates me because as, as a former military person, I took an oath to defend the United States and its constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And as far as I'm concerned, the administrations we have had in office for the past 10, 15, maybe 20 years maybe even longer, have been domestic enemies of our Constitution, and they have been working to undermine it and chop it away a piece at a time in all these passing years. Yeah, and you know the trap to that whole thing is that when I was a kid and my dad, being a preacher, used to complain about the government and the rich getting richer, poor getting poorer, and, you know, all the other stuff you still hear today, I used to think, oh, it just seems that way to him. He's getting pipe fed with uh, church propaganda and you know this ain't really real because I mean I'm seeing the movies I'm going to and the go-kart tracks I'm going to life doesn't appear to me to be anything like I hear him describing it but then when you get older you begin to see all this stuff for yourself and you know you're not crazy right. but it's kind of like a trap that the uh, young generation can't figure it out until it's really already too late to do anything about it yeah, yeah, that's true. It's a mess, but, you know... Yeah, it either. really is. Mm -hmm. Now, um, 
there was something else I was going to make mention of. Uh, does the military have anything to do? Um, like, are they getting any kind of kickback, or is there any benefit to the military of allowing the aliens to do this hybridization program? Uh, yes, there is. There's like a technology transfer uh, or exchange. Uh, basically, what I've uh, come to understand in my research is that the ETs kind of said, well, we need to do this with some members of your population, and in exchange, we will give you technology and we'll give you uh, some of our people will help you understand and learn the technology like a consultant. And so, and I want to make it clear that this is not all ETs, but one, one or two maybe particular groups of ETs that have a, a less than healthy agenda for the human race. But there, are, I think there are a lot of good ETs out there that are trying to figure out how they can intercede on our behalf and how they can uh, help us without interfering with um, with what's going on here, without interfering with our spiritual development process, which this all this chaos and all the stuff going on on this planet is part of our spiritual development process. Well, I, I think personally, for my way of uh, viewing it, mm -hmm. that what's going down down here on Earth with the good and the bad is really a part of the uh, choosing process and the learning how to uh, integrate process. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you know, how do you integrate the bad into the good part of you that's good to where you can live life with it without actually becoming bad yourself, for example? Right. Uh-huh. Well, it's kind of tricky. I mean, some people are abused and they become abusers. Other people are abused and they go the in the complete different direction. And I'm kind of one of those. For me, uh, people that are unkind, that's a cardinal sin as far as I'm concerned. You don't abuse people. You don't uh, use them and throw them aside like a piece of garbage. And uh, there's kind of a rule that I go by where if I'm going to say something, I ask myself, is it true, first, of, first and foremost? Is it necessary that I say this? And is it kind? If it doesn't meet two of those criteria, then I just don't say it. Okay. Yeah, I was sitting here thinking about this. And, uh, you know, we were talking about why uh, about some people that, Let's say, for instance, one girl gets raped as a child, and so does another one. However, when they both grow up, one might go on to try to, you know, help people that have that happen to them overcome it and be there for them, while the other one grows up, goes through depression, and doesn't even make to be a very good mother in the long run. You know, cause I've thought about that before and wondered what makes that happen. And you know what? It seems like no matter how much I can... Uh, don't I put into it? The only thing I can even come up with or fathom is perhaps the one that didn't fare so well was the one who felt sorry for themselves, kept the attitude about, well, why should I try? Nobody was there for me, and you know what I'm saying? Yeah. While the other one, uh, didn't have a, oh, woe is me attitude, in other words. Mm -hmm. In other words, a matter of victim, uh, victim mentality versus Victoria, victor mentality. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that the spiritual development of the soul that has the experiences really determines which way they could go with it. If, if a soul is very evolved and, and an old soul, so to speak, then that soul may have learned that any form of abuse is a really bad thing, and they may go in that more kind, gentle direction where they help others. But then a, a newer soul who doesn't have all the life experiences to draw from they might actually get angry or shut down or get depressed, like you say. I know it takes all kinds. We do get all kinds. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there anything about uh, the book that we haven't covered yet you want to get out there that, uh, while we still got time? Mm -hmm. Well, let me see. Um, part three is pretty good. Uh, I get into a lot of the insights, a lot of the spiritual things. And that's the one thing that's kind of different about my book is I'm looking at what is in the world 
and all the problems in the world. I'm not blinding myself or shutting my eyes to it and just trying to focus on love and light and, and hope it'll get better. You know, that's just not my way of doing things. I've had to look into the darkest of the dark to try to understand what happened to me and to try to process it and to try to heal. And the only thing that really helped me to make sense of all of it was my spiritual perspective. And so I, I really think that if you try to look at this phenomenon and you try to look at all the dark things that are happening in the world and not bring in the spiritual side, the light side, you're doing yourself a great disservice because there's a lot of dark things going on in the world and it can really drag you down and it can really impact your life if you don't have the spirituality and looking at the light side to balance it. You know what? That is very, very true, at least for me. I mean, when I was really young, I had severe anger issues. I got in fights like four times a day. Um, I was constantly sent from one home to the next home uh, behind my anger issues. Uh, none of them could e ever kick me in the length of time because none of them could control me, in other words. I mean, I had a really severe case. And I got up into my 30s and still had this here situation until one day me and my wife had gotten into a big, huge argument because she had a dedicated Joshua to the church behind my back, which I, I didn't mind her dedicating them. It, it was the principle that I'm the father, why ain't I being included in this process, in other words? You know, mm -hmm. felt kind of like I'm being betrayed or left out. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and it sent me into a big rage. Me and her had a big, huge yelling match. And then the kids come down with pink eye, and we're having to run them to the ER. And, well, the car keeps dying. And at one red light, when it dies, I just lose it, get out, slim my arm through the window. And... Uh, well, I lost um, at least 20% use of it that day for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow. Um, but we ended up uh, behind that uh, going through financial hard times while I was recovering and even ended up in a mission. And while we were in the mission, I started reading the Bible. And I read the New Testament a lot at first. And the thing that word that kept coming back to me that I kept trying to understand more and more was spirit. I was drawn to want to know more about spirit. I, at the time, I didn't know why, but the more I read and the more I studied over time, the more my um, temper came under control. Mm -hmm. uh, here it is some 20-odd years later, and I've mastered a bunch of control. But I can't help but go back and think that, uh, you know, knowledge of spirit and a, de a desire to learn about it is what actually got me there, which would go along with what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, life puts pressure on us to awaken in all kinds of things, and if it doesn't, if we don't listen the first time, it gets a bigger hammer to get our attention. <laughs> really glad I listened when I did. Yeah. I think I got a second hammer behind my health. <laughs> but late to do yeah. anything about that now too. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Believe me, I've had a few big hammers come down in my life too. So. Well, are you working on any new books? Not yet. There are more books in me, and I will be writing more, but um, again, I'm kind of taking a break right now, and um, just I need to move, you know, from the place that I'm living. I, I want to find a better place to live, and, you know, there's just a lot going on in my life right now, but I will be writing more books. I will be starting uh, groups uh, to help people like myself heal, and um, I will be uh, doing more speaking out there, and... Um, just, you know, I have a lot of plans for the future. Okay, well, that much is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be happy to help you out with that any time I can. You know, you can always, uh, if you need to come let people know what you got going on, you can give me a call and set up a, another interview if you like. That would be wonderful. I very much appreciate that, Royce. Now, is there any last-minute thoughts you have for everybody out there? Um, just look around you with a discerning eye and... Uh, don't accept things at face value. And your body is a wonderful sensory tool. When incoming information comes in, whether you hear it or see it, or you know somebody is talking to you, um, watch how the information lands in your body. Because our bodies really do have a built-in bullshit detector. 
called our intuition. And if you listen to how it feels when it hits your body, you can start to get a sense of whether people are telling you the truth or whether they're not telling you the truth. And uh, that's something that I think people really need to pay attention to. I really feel like we all have intuition, but we have forgotten how it feels when we're using it. And so we rely more on the, on the brain and uh, the mental realm than we do on our intuition. But I think we're really meant to work uh, between our logical mind, our emotions, and our intuition. All, the, all three of those things are meant to work together. And the more you can develop your intuition, the better off you're going to be. Then you don't have to take people's word for anything. You can assess for yourself. And there will be trial and error, and you won't get it all right all the time. But if you practice, you can sharpen it up. Yeah, I do believe it is one of those. The more you use, the stronger it gets. It's uh, you know, Did you know that even when it comes to appliances and cars and such, that they have to be used to be maintained? Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, the same is true with your body. Uh, it's true with your memory. It's true with every facet of life, I think. It really is. It really is. Use, use, it, or, use it or lose it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. That was popular from my Marine Corps days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Actually, you were in the service, you said? What branch? I was in the Air Force. Air Force, okay. Yeah, I was in Uncle Sam's Misguided Children. <laughs> <laughs> But I tell you what, I hear so many people saying all oh, horse shit, no uh, cow shit, and all of that. Mm-hmm. I think I'm just going to, uh, to break the monotony and start saying all oh, pig shit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That sounds good. I, I just had to um, add a little humor because when you said that a minute ago, uh-huh. it, it, it kind of humor there just kind of popped in my head for a minute. And I'm the kind of person I have trouble not sharing it when it pops in my head. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear you. Alrighty, well, yeah, we that's got... some of the stinkiest shit there is, too. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say I do? <laughs> no, I said I said pig shit is some of the oh. stinkiest stuff that there is, too. I think it's worse than horse and cow and everything put together. Well, that was the case. You ever went in the bathroom after me, you'd swear I was a pig. <laughs> but, okay, I show that it's time to do a close for the show. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. I really enjoyed this uh time we spent together today would like to thank all the listeners for listening in and before i let you guys escape i want to remind y'all one more time if i can get that page there it is to open back up that her website is facing the shadow embracing the light.com and i want to remind you guys that this coming wednesday may 21st and let me double check that's the right wednesday here Yes, it is. Um, at 7 p.m., Savana Arienta will be returning, and we're going to be talking about her book, Lightworker Source. And then y'all may want to visit me again over at Revolution Radio Thursday at 1 p.m. Central, where I'll be interviewing Kevin Falsam on Quantum Gnosis. And I look forward to seeing everybody at both of those shows. I hope you can make it. I uh, want to thank you guys for listening in. I couldn't have a show with my listeners anymore, and I couldn't have one without my guests. So if you listened, you participated, and I do appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you all again. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>